Grab your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 8. Um, if you're new around here, we're literally walking through the whole book of Acts. It is a second book by a guy named Luke, who was a doctor. Um, and in his second book, he kind of takes account of how human beings for the first time ever become usable by God. God pours out his spirit as promised by the Father. And as the spirit of God is poured out, we are each given power. We're each given gifts. And because of the power gifts sitting on the grace of Jesus, you and I have purpose, something to live for, not our own kingdom to build, but God's kingdom. And it's beautiful to watch the book of Acts because we get to see that Jesus's vehicle for ministry, the church, somebody say, that's me. Come on, say, that's me. Yeah, the church is, is you and I, and it's the vehicle of expansion. Somebody say expansion. Yeah, and it's exactly what Jesus promised. Jesus promised if he could get you and I together, he could give us his grace, give us his power, and gift us that we could be his embodiment and that that would grow and expand. And it's what Jesus promised in Matthew's gospel, chapter 16. Here's Jesus's actual words, firsthand account. It says, I will put together my church. Somebody say, that's me. Yeah, that's me. A church, I love this word, so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. So we're watching that happen. As you study the book of Acts, it starts in an upper room. There's like 120. It grows to thousands of people. Why? That's what he said would happen, that the light would be so good, so powerful, that it would change lives. Not a few, but a whole lot. For God so loved the world. So you see this expansion of God's kingdom. And so um, last week we studied a guy named Stephen who got stoned for people that moved from the West Coast. We're not talking about like, <laughs> he literally got murdered and stoned. And the people who are persecuting, specifically a guy named Saul of Tarsus, thought that if they persecuted the church and they would scatter the church, that they would end the church. But Jesus promised a church that would be expensive. So what they did not realize, watch this, as you persecute the church and scatter, <laughs> you don't dilute it, you multiply it. Because ah! God is so good that if he promised it, his promise will reign true. And so you see that as, as Stephen was murdered, the church is expanding now instead of one area, multiple areas. And so uh, next week, oh God, do not miss next week. Next week you get us, how many people love a before and after? Six of you. Okay, let me ask you again. How many of you love a good before and after? Okay, next week, you and I get to witness Saul's conversion. So imagine a former terrorist becomes a planter of many churches. Um, so you get to see that. And I want you to know this. And if you're watching or in the room and you feel like you're far from God, so glad you're here. Our churches are doors. Our church doors are wide open for any Saul to ever come in because we see the Paul in Saul. And so if you know somebody that's a Saul so far away from God, oh my gosh, next week is a phenomenal time to bring somebody. I would get here early um, so that you can make sure you get a seat. Um, Saul to Paul is next week. Okay, let's dive in. Acts chapter eight, verse 26 to 35. A beautiful story today of New Testament purpose. God giving you power to experience purpose. I'm gonna read the whole thing. I'm trying to give you a little bit of context. I'll pray and then we'll get out here and do this thing. Everybody say, do that thing. Amen. By the way, if you're wondering how I'm doing, <laughs> I'd rather not talk about it. It's just a bunch of young boys playing with a pigskin. It's not a big deal. <laughs> or that's what I tell myself to go to sleep after Alabama loses to Vanderbilt. <laughs> Guys, we're going to change the message today. Let's talk about hell. Let's talk about <laughs> how hot it can be for... <laughs> oh, by the way, you can tell a team's not good when they win and take the goalpost all the way to the river. <laughs> I'm not bitter. Okay, I'm a little bitter. It's <laughs> whatever. Okay, Acts chapter 8. Let's study God's Word together. Open your Bibles. Open your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, bring a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a Bible, uh, or you can go digital, but man, get a Bible, get a Bible. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 35. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, oh, I love this language, go south to the road 
And then that's our campus pastor right there talking about. Um, if you don't know this yet, uh, this is really cool because our church family actually feels called by God as well to go south to launch a campus in south. So think Frank, Franklin, Brentwood area, we feel called to do it. We already have a ton of people that drive from there, so we want them not to have to drive 45 minutes or their friends. And so uh, discipleship's hard when you have to travel 45 minutes all the time. And so I very, feel very compelled to do that. By the way, since to go south, if you feel interested, at all. If there's any interest, October 20th, after every service, you can sign up right now. There's a little tap thing that you always tap into. You can sign up today to make sure you go to that after every service um, on October 20th to find out more information about what South could look like for you and I to do that together. Amen? Uh, Spirit of the Lord said, go South to the road, the desert road. Underline that. I'm going to give some context to here. So this was actually an old road. They call it a desert road because it was like an old road. They'd already made new roads. So not only was the Spirit saying go south when you're in Jerusalem to a desert, but also to a road, a road that nobody no longer travels. That goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, if you're in middle school, you'll just have to ask your mom and dad what a eunuch is. Um, what a eunuch is in, in antiquity is, especially in Ethiopia, for a king to trust another man with his uh, wife's uh, heirloom or with, with the finances in Ethiopia, the kings believed that they were above business affairs, so they would allow the queen to handle all of the finances in Ethiopia. And so in order for the king to trust, some of the ladies are like, yes, all the shopping I want, let's go, right? So in order for the king to trust that man, he would castrate that man and then be like, okay, now you can hang out with my wife. I don't know. Doesn't sound like a horrible idea to me. <laughs> Met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, which, is, which means queen of Ethiopia. So he handled all the financial responsibilities of the queen as the eunuch. Continue reading. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Underline this. This is very interesting. This eunuch, who had, was very powerful in the country of Nigeria, or Ethiopia rather, had traveled 1,500 miles by chariot to go to Jerusalem to worship. He, he's searching. If you travel that far, you go going to find something. Hello. And on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, notice in the book of Acts, over and over and over. We've told you for weeks and now months. You and I cannot fulfill the purpose of God without the Spirit of God. You and I desperately, desperately need the Spirit of God. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So I don't know, does that mean like jog alongside or like hit the camel harder so you're close? I don't know, but like stay near the chariot. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come in and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Speaking of Jesus, and by the way, this is not a firsthand account. This is prophecy from Isaiah some 800 years prior. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? I love this. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments where we gather together. We are not just here together, but we're here with you. And your Scriptures are being opened. Your Spirit is being poured out. We are experiencing a move of God and we're grateful that you're moving. We think about the 42 decisions committed to Christ last week and the 65 baptisms. And Father, we, we pinch ourselves knowing we can't believe that we get to be a part of what you're doing. We're very grateful, very honored. Father, as we lean into the scriptures today, I'm aware, Father, that there are others who feel like they are in a desert, just like Philip. 
on a road that may not make sense. There are people who showed up this morning with questions about life. There are people under the sound of my voice who do not know why they're here. There are people under the sound of my voice, Father, that don't know their purpose. And I pray today, Father, you would speak through me. Speak through your divine scripture so that we can find, step into, and engage with purpose. Just like Philip. Speak to us and we'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. And everybody at the 930 said a rowdy amen. 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 If you're taking notes, I want, to, I want you to write this down. It'll serve you as a title as we study the scripture today. Write this down if you're taking notes. And if you're not taking notes, write this one down. Okay. Purpose in the desert. Purpose. Amen. Purpose in the desert. I want to say it again. Purpose in the desert. Purpose in the desert. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through the text back again. And I want you to stop and I want you to notice things. I want you to notice the heart of God. I want you to notice Philip's response to being led. And then I want you ultimately to see the moment that happened because this moment is transformational. And also, you can look back in world history, this moment echoes into eternity. The entire continent of Africa experiences the gospel because of this little bitty moment in the Gaza desert. Amen? So I want to walk through the text. Let's start with the first part of the text. It says this, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, everybody underline this, go south. Go south to the road, and not just to any road, to a desert road. When he's in Jerusalem, he hears the voice of the Lord speak, and the Spirit says go. But how many of you guys know that when it comes to purpose, God doesn't always write it in a journal and hand it to you? Like, I, I imagine Philip being so frustrated that God's like, um, go south. Uh, go to a desert. I'm like, God, are you talking like 30A or Cozumel? Hello. Like, th there is no specificity. It's like, head a direction, go south, and by the way, head south to a desert. And this is interesting to me because I feel like this passage ministers a great deal of clarity around the subject of purpose because most of us have been taught that purpose is the answer why. It is clear. It has maps. It has directions. It's specific. And yet God is delivering a mountain of purpose, watch this, to a guy named Philip that doesn't make a hill of beans worth a sense. He just says, go south. He just says, go to this, and it's not even a good road, it's a road nobody any longer uses. Head south. You know what I notice about purpose? Purpose never makes sense in seed form. When God whispers purpose to your life, I'm just here to tell you, if you're looking for clarity, you're looking for the wrong thing. It won't always be clear. Ask Noah. God's like, Noah, build a boat. Noah had never seen rain. There had never been a flood. And if you think that, if somebody has taught you that purpose is why you exist, and so you've been searching for clarity, when purpose shows up and doesn't look like clarity, you may miss it. May I warn you, clarity can be an idol. I mean, what would have happened in this text if Philip would have said, whoa, 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 hold up, dog. Oh, you probably can't say that to God, but imagine if Philip would have said, uh, which way south? In which desert? And um, I, I'll move forward, God, when you're a little bit more clear. When you lead me a little bit better, when you, when you give me the coordinates, when you give me the directions, when you print out the map quest, hello, I'll go. And may I warn you that purpose doesn't always include a why at the beginning. One of my favorite things as we look into the text that you and I can learn from Philip's response who got purpose right in the desert is, is the language, he, so he started out. Watch this. When the Spirit said go, Philip said yes. I want you to notice the simplicity because I know, I don't know about you, but a lot of us, when the Spirit says go, not all of us start, some of us stall. 
Because once again, if you think that purpose always includes clarity, you'll say, well, hold up, I'm not gonna go until it's clear. What I love about Philip is he just headed that way. Can I ask you a question? If God was leading you, and he is, would you be okay starting without knowing? Because that's what faith looks like. Faith looks like I trust that God who is only good, when he says go, I don't have to know where before I say yes. And if you, if you wanna step into purpose, one of the first things we have to realize is it won't always be clear but it will always be good. If God is leading me, I don't have to know everything to start. Why? My purpose is dependent on my willingness to start. Are you willing to start with your hands shaking? Are you willing to have what I call stinky starts? How many people don't like to start something until you know what you are doing? How many people don't like to look like a fool? Y'all lying in church. How many people don't like to look like a fool? You're like, that's the why I'm not raising my hands, stupid. <laughs> if I had a word for you this morning, it'd be simple. When the spirit says go, what I mean by says, nudges. You ever felt the nudge? Like you're at the restaurant and you just ate and it was phenomenal. So good. Had appetite, whatever. What you ate and it's good. And at the end, you feel this little nudge like, man, I sh I sh th this girl needs something. My waitress needs something. You ever felt the nudge to tip? Instead of stalling, just do it. Well, let me say it this way. When the Spirit says go, what I love about Philip is he went. When the Spirit says go, if you think the Spirit could be saying it, just do it. Does it sound like something God would say? Does it sound like a good thing? Does it sound like a holy thing? Does it sound like a right thing? I'm no longer, watch this, going to dissect the desert or the road until it makes sense to me. I'll step on what he tells me to step on because even if it's water, he can turn water into something that's walkable if I'll trust him when I don't know. I don't have to know everything to take a step. Somebody say, take a step. If you want to step towards purpose, you don't have to know it all. I think, I think he does that way. He does know all the steps. I don't think he tells it to you because then I would depend on my own self. And the scripture says, lean not into your own understanding. When the spirit says, go, go. If the spirit says, go talk to somebody, you don't have to figure out the conversation first. Hello. If the spirit says, start being generous, you don't have to get out your calculator first. The question for generosity is not what can I afford? It's God, what do you want me to do? Right. Am I helping you this morning? If you feel called by God, the Spirit's like, I know you don't want to, but get in a small group. You don't have to dissect the first awkward moments of, hi, my name's Shady. Just go. I wonder how much would change in our lives if the Spirit nudged me and I just said, okay. I, I, think, I think sometimes we over dissect purpose and miss out on obedience. And it is provision that follows obedience, not provision that follows my, my ability. It's just yes, everybody say yes. You're like, I don't wanna be yes man, I do. I do. I surrender all. Come on, I surrender. Guess what that means, all. If you want to go God's way, be willing to say yes before you understand it all. Thank you, Philip. Everybody say, thank you, Philip. Let's continue the text. This man had gone to Jerusalem. Here's what I want you to see. Whew. Okay, watch this, watch this. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? Okay, okay. So, so Philip, all he knows is go south, go to a desert, go to a road. That's all he knows. When you're led by the Spirit... You won't know everything. Now watch this. You also won't see everything. Remember, purpose doesn't make sense in the moment. It only makes sense when you're testifying. The seed never makes sense under the soil. It's seed, it's a little bit of time, and then it's harvest. Does that make sense? So it's crucial for me to show you, because we have the text, because we have the story, I want to show you what Philip could not see. Because in order for you to embrace purpose, you have to decide to step before you see. If you're going to embrace purpose and step in what God has for you, you can't wait till it makes sense. The Bible says, the just shall live by faith. 
not by sight. I'm feeling it this morning. Let's go. It says, this man had gone to worship. Philip had no clue that while he was wandering around in a desert searching, there was another man who was also searching. A man who had been searching for a very long time. Been to church before. Traveled 1,500 miles to go to church and was sitting in his chariot, his first century Benz. Hello. Had a lot of money. Could have been a Rolls Royce chariot. I don't know. Philip had no clue that when he was in a desert on a road where he thought nobody would be, the man who would take the gospel to Africa, who had been searching for God. You know, there's some people that have been to worship before, that have read the text before, that still don't know Jesus. And if we're not careful, we'll miss that moment. We'll be looking for why when God at the gas station. God, why am I going through this? Why am I in a desert? And God's like, it's not the why, it's who. I'm complaining about why, but I'm at the gas station wondering why gas is so high. And across from me is purpose named Tom who can't pay his own gas. Purpose is not as much why as it could be who. God will put you around some people in the middle of a desert that you don't want to go to. Anybody ever been in a desert season? On a road you don't want to travel. Hello. I don't like this way. God can use any way. God is all terrain. He can use the right job. Come on, I I love this about God. The wrong place and the wrong time is usually a wrong outcome unless God gets involved. Come on, somebody. You could be in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people, and if God steps in that moment, an ordinary moment becomes a supernatural moment because God works all things together for his good. Give him about five seconds of praise if you believe that. This man had been looking... For the Lord. I love this in the back part of the text. It says, so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage. So he reads the passage. So Philip ran to the chariot. He invited him to come. So he opens a chariot. He reads the scripture. And then watch this. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about? So he ran alongside the chariot, got up in the chariot, asked him, did he know what he was talking about? He said, I don't know. Can you explain it to me? Watch. Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. If you're trying to understand purpose, you have to realize purpose takes place in ordinary places. Ordinary places. And what I love about this is it teaches me something about purpose. Because the Holy Spirit told him to find the chariot, and it also told him to stay close to it. Can I tell you something about purpose? Purpose requires persistence. Persistence. You know how many people in life I've seen be drawn by the Spirit of God to a desert, spend some time digging a ditch, get tired of digging the ditch and run away from the ditch and then here comes some rain and somebody else drinks from the ditch you dug? If you wanna understand purpose, I love this with Philip because he goes to the desert, goes to the road, runs up to the chariot, gets in the chariot and he stays long enough to lean in. You know what I thought about this week? If he had a phone, I don't know that this happens. Because he would say, God, this ain't the way. This ain't the road. And this dude's from Ethiopia. I don't really know how to talk to eunuchs. Or he would have compared whatever he was riding with the chariot. He would have got caught so in the comparison trap that he couldn't even get in the chariot because he feels insecure because he's comparing. It's, it's hard to enjoy life while comparing. And I thought, man, if he would have had a phone, I wonder if he would have missed it. I wonder if he'd have been so caught up, with, oh, look at that chariot. I see you, Ethiopia. We out here in these streets. Can I give some of you a word real quick? Stay. Some of you, it takes more faith to stay than to go. That friendship, that business, those relationships, that small group, you can't have fruit without presence. Pastor Craig Rochelle says it like this. He says, I've seen a lot of people that over-exaggerate what God would do in the short run and thus 
grossly underestimate what God would do in the long run if you would just stay and be faithful. It requires persistence. It's not just going to the desert. It's going to that road, even when it doesn't make sense. It's riding along that stranger's chariot. It's getting in the chariot. And watch this. And leaning into the conversation. If you notice, Philip started in the passage that that guy was in. He leaned into the Isaiah. He leaned into where he was at. He leaned into where he was. And you have to be present in order to embrace your purpose. You got to be present. Because watch, if you're not present and you're just looking for the why, you miss the who. May I encourage you, even those of you who would say you're in some type of desert, God does his best work in unlikely places. And if you will have enough faith to believe, no, 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 I'm going to put my phone down in this conversation. Because I know you're from Ethiopia, and I'm from Jerusalem, and you're a eunuch, and I, you know, I ain't that. Hello. And you're talking about, you're talking about Isaiah, and, and, and I'm on a different reading plan. But if you will lean into whatever moment God provides, what you will realize is purpose happens in moments. Moments. It's less about the destination. And if you read the text, it says, on the way he found the eunuch. God will give you on the way in life, in the journey. God has supernatural moments, but you got to have your eyes open. And that's what I love about Philip. He ran towards, he stayed with, he listened to, he leaned in, he engaged. And what you see is beautiful. This dude, the eunuch, gives his life to Christ, gets spontaneously baptized on the spot. It's like there's a pond, dive in, let's go. I'm down. Baptized on the spot. Philip immediately goes to tell somebody else. So he's going to different towns. He literally disappears and goes away. And, and the eunuch's like, where'd you go? And he's rejoicing. And it's a beautiful story. Because based on everything we can find in world history, the way that the gospel of Jesus Christ gets to Africa is through that guy, the Ethiopian eunuch. And I bet if you would have rewound the story and went to Philip, and be like, hey, uh... What's God telling you? <laughs> uh, I, I feel like, I know it sounds stupid, but I feel like I'm, feel like I'm supposed to go to the desert. You'd be like, um, have you thought about that at all? Or you got like a plan or you got a mentor? You know, he'd have to tell you, I, I just, I feel like it's of the Lord. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but I don't have to make sense of everything before I step into the next thing. And I'm just gonna lean in, eyes open. Not obsessing about why. Clarity is a false idol. We have one to be worshiped. His name is Jesus. And because my eyes are open, not looking for why to everything, but who? God, who do you have in the desert? Got a lizard, got a eunuch, and whatever, I don't care. Whoever is here, whoever's in my sphere of influence, whoever's in my cubicle, who's ever in my office, who's ever in my neighbor, even if I'm in a desert season, God has purpose there. Purpose. It's about who? Write this down if you're taking notes. Purpose is about people meeting Jesus. Don't let the oversimplification of that be watered down in your mind. Take this individually. My purpose is about people. So I gotta look up, I gotta engage. I can't be so on my phone in the meeting that I miss out the fact that this eunuch's probably been searching for a long time. This person's been searching for a long time. Who knows that they've been searching? Who knows what they need to have explained to them? Who knows? God does. That's why I'm here. Can I tell you something? If they're in your sphere of influence, I think that's on purpose. If you're rubbing shoulders, I think it's on purpose. Why? Purpose is about people meeting Jesus. Your life is going to make the most sense and be most fulfilled when you and I decide to do this. On the job, meet people, point them to Jesus. Can I encourage you something? I don't, I don't know what you're going to hear in the chariot. Like, I, I don't know like, what his issue is going to be. In this one, it was like he didn't understand a text, but maybe in your context, they're not going to understand why they still struggle. 
Maybe, maybe in, in your context, when you rub shoulders and you lean in because you're not looking for why as much as who, maybe that friend's gonna have anorexia. Maybe they were abused. Maybe they don't understand why they had to file bankruptcy. Maybe they moved here and they, they're like, I just got Nashville. It's a verb. It's like I moved here and was gonna get community and now I get drunk five nights a week and I, I just got Nashville. And I just, I don't know what's happening. Wherever there's a problem, where there, wherever there is a sin in that conversation, you know what I love? The answer for your purpose and my purpose is always the same. Jesus. For Isaiah, the text, guess what the answer was? Jesus. For your friend who's depressed, guess what the answer is? It's Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. You don't have to make sense out of every problem. You don't have to be Captain Knowledge. Introduce them to the answers. Jesus, tell them about Jesus. Why? Your purpose is tied to people. One of my favorite verses, write this down and we're done. I just hope you're encouraged that even if you're in a desert, God can make sense of the desert places. Proverbs chapter number 11, verse 30 says this, the fruit of the righteous, oh, I love this, the fruit of the, the evidence of the righteous, the purpose, the fulfillment of the righteous, watch this, is a tree of life. Ooh. See yourself like this. Come on, see yourself like this. Who makes you righteous? Okay, you came in at about a three out of 10, okay? Who makes you righteous? Jesus, Jesus makes you righteous. And what's the fruit? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Do you see your purpose like an orchard? Think about your family. Why? Our God is a generational God. Your decision today to follow Christ is not just your decision. Oh, generations of fruit. Souls. Think about what you and I get to be a part of in Peru and in the Carolinas right now. It's a tree. Your purpose is a tree of life. And whoever captures souls, another text said, whoever wins souls is wise. So today's message is for anybody who's trying to dial in purpose. And for whatever reason, somebody told you purpose is when you had all the answers to why I'm here, why I have these gifts, why I have this job. And I propose maybe it's not as much why at your job as the person who needs a conversation with you at the water cooler? Who? And so here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to help you with just a couple practical things for you to dial up purpose. In fact, one of the things that we do as a church is um, we make sure to equip you for moments like this. So if you're in the main auditorium or if you're in another room with additional seating, in the lobby, if you can call that thing a lobby, um, we have these little cards that say church isn't the same without you. And it's just, it says plan your visit so we can take care of people and help the first time. I would encourage you after every service, every Sunday, if I'm you, I would grab one of these. And I would just put them in your pocketbook or your wallet or your purse or your handbag so that if you ever get in a conversation, you can watch this, connect community to a conversation. What is it doing? It's helping you be ready when the moment shows up. It's, when you have this, you're gonna be looking. Got at the gas station, when somebody's waiting, I'm looking for somebody to say, hey, Jesus loves you, and there's some people I think that you'd love to hang out with that would love to hang out with you. Enjoy this tip. But I'm not just, watch this, I'm not just gonna give you a sample of God, I'm gonna give you an invitation to God's house. I think that's a practical way for you and I to see moments. Another way is for, if, you, if you're not on a team serving, I want you to know that there's a whole team called a dream team of people who have identified their gifts, identified a team. And last weekend when 42 people committed to follow Christ, those people know my little part on the team played a big deal on that. And they may not tell you their life is perfect, but you know what? I talk to dream team people all the time. You know what they say? It's my favorite day of the week. I was in Gold's Gym yesterday. 
I was in Gold's gym yesterday. I've been twice. It's whatever. <laughs> I'm so sore right now, by the way. I hate it. Like, can I go to the silver one? Is there a silver option? It's, this lady came up. This lady came up. And by the way, I think she was lifting more. It was just so embarrassing. And she's like, hey, um, I go to Zill and, and uh, God changed my life. And Sundays are my favorite day of the week. I hear it all the time. That's not people that are like, you know, just, just consuming a service. They would worship a service, but they would also serve one. And I'm just telling you, you don't have to do it, but I think you should. Because your purpose, you don't have to believe it or not. Just, you can go try it. You'll be back. Purpose is about people meeting Jesus. And if you, if you can ever tie eternity to humanity and serve on a team and know that you're a part of helping somebody do that, the why not may, may not get clear, but your purpose will. Because purpose isn't so much why, it's who.